Like many other subjects which are under more or less constant analysis, there are uh, numerous misunderstandings. European alchemy is not of great antiquity, and the rumors about its roots in the mysterious past are highly symbolized. Actually, we have almost nothing on the subject of alchemy in European literature prior to the beginning of the 15th century AD. And nearly all of the so-called earlier works are backdated. That is, they were prepared and printed after the year 1500, but with fictitious dates of an earlier <coughs> period added to them. There is very little of alchemy in the Inconocula printing of the first 50 years of printing between uh, 1445 and 1500. And we have very little evidence uh, that the alchemical writings attributed to ancient authors are genuine. For example, there are books, presumably, alchemical writings of Aristotle, which are certainly comparatively modern fabrications. <coughs> also, a number of fictitious characters were invented during the 16th and 17th centuries as having lived at a much earlier date. But these inventions or unreal persons have no historical foundation. Actually, we find the phenomenon of the rise of alchemical symbolism and thought almost paralleling the rise of European astrological speculation and the rising of secret societies and of Rosicrucianism in Europe. Now, alchemy is not limited to European countries, that we know. Uh, remnants of it and references to it are to be found in the writings of many ancient Asiatic peoples. But the rise of alchemy in China, like that in Europe, is comparatively late when compared to the fabulous and legendary accounts thereof. So we must recognize we're in the presence of a rather mysterious situation, namely that a art or cult arose in Europe, uh, which was given an antiquity by means of a certain exaggeration on the part of those working with it. And actually, alchemy, as we are going to consider it, developed within the period between uh, about the year 1500 and the year 1700. During these two centuries, this symbolism developed and elaborated itself almost beyond human imagination. Most of the symbols employed by the alchemists were derived from earlier sources. <coughs> but there was also a wonderful a mixture of creative ingenuity evident in the designs and figures. Some are obviously derived from mythology. Uh, some from natural history as it was understood or misunderstood by the writers of that period. Certain parts of it belong to the symbolisms of ancient religious cults. A part was taken from the older symbolism of astrology. Uh, still other elements are almost unique to alchemy and do not occur elsewhere. Thus, historically speaking, we are dealing with a body of lore that rose to prominence, flourished for two centuries, and then gradually declined with the rise of chemistry as we know it today. I think we should bear in mind that there was an alchemy in antiquity very roughly and inadequately drawn, but that actually, while we say that alchemy is the mother of chemistry, we might be wiser to realize that there was also a chemistry prior to alchemy, and that alchemy did not simply give rise to chemistry. Chemistry of an earlier day gave rise to alchemy, and this in turn uh, declined again, and chemistry once more emerged as the principal uh, carrier of tradition in this field of learning. Now, in consideration of these elements and factors, we are not in the presence merely of a great traditional account handed down for thousands of years, but of a cleverly devised program, integrated and perfected within a comparatively short period of time. Uh, this integration has a definite bearing upon the perpetuation of certain schools of philosophy and mysticism that originated in antiquity and also passed through various vicissitudes in the rise of European culture. 
Let us try to draw a picture of Europe at the time of the emergence of alchemy. Europe itself was coming out of the Dark Ages. It had just passed through the Renaissance of the Reformation. The human mind was beginning to break the tremendous bonds that bound medieval man to a reactionary traditionalism. The human mind was also rebelling against the dogmatic theology which dominated this entire period of European history. For several hundred years, men had been unable to use their minds. In the first place, there was no way of training minds. There were no schools. There were no universities. There was practically no opportunity for the average citizen to become educated. The second problem was that Europe was devastated by natural and man-made catastrophes. The bubonic plague swept Europe. And during the course of about 300 years, its periodic ravages total somewhere in the neighborhood of some 50 to 100 million human beings died of this plague. During this same period also, the rise of the Inquisition is to be noted, and the tremendous attack upon heresy, upon liberalism and free thinking of all kinds. Even such schools and universities as did come into existence under the great cloister school system of Charlemagne were limited by a most reactionary and patristic philosophy. Even the physician did not dare to perform autopsy, did not dare uh, to dissect the human body. He was bound completely to writing to Galen and Avicenna, authorities, traditional authorities, whose writings covered the field from the minor elements of the human body to the probable causes of volcanic eruptions. These traditional textbooks <coughs> did not give any opportunity or any individualism to the mind of the person. He was simply schooling according to tradition, schooled within a very narrow boundary of acceptances and rejections. Within the church itself, a number of systems of philosophy had arisen, particularly the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas. This man had a magnificent mind, but bound that he was, again, by the limitations of his church and his time, he was unable to break through into the free atmosphere of liberal thinking. Rebels of that period, like Bruno, Savonarola, and even Paracelsus, paid with their lives, or with their worldly goods and honors, for their efforts to break through this traditional path. In this same period, demonism and demonology and necromancy flourished. The mysterious magic attributed to King Solomon was restored. The grimoires came into existence, and men went out to cross roads at night to invoke spirits. It was a time of rather dismal intellectual benevolence. Yet this oppression forced upon man was not exactly in order with his growth and evolution. A more ancient man had achieved much more. The Greek and Roman civilization had given the world a magnificent love. The philosophical fables of Egypt and the Near East were spectacular. And these achievements and accomplishments did not simply die, they could not. The human being will not stop thinking and cannot stop thinking because someone tells him he must. Thus there was beneath the surface of European thought and European life a tremendous surge of intellectualism, a surge which could not break through, but which did begin to emerge as soon as the positive definition began to lift the boundaries on human thinking. Now against this pressure from within the individual himself, the pressure of his own anatomy, uh, there was the force of a limiting condition of environment. Internal pressure but plus this tremendous adamant boundary fixed upon his thinking and living resulted in an explosion, resulted in a definite breaking through from the internal psychic life of the human being. Now, we cannot say, I don't agree with some psychologists who affirm that alchemy simply emerged from the individual, that it did remotely and originally do so, and that its forms undoubtedly were influenced by the pressures of the human psyche, we do not deny it. But I cannot accept that it was merely a spontaneous outburst. It was too well organized, too well developed, too carefully thought through. It is far more reasonable and likely that it represented a new appearance of a tradition struggling to restore its own place as a leader in the intellectual life of the human being. 
Now we know, as I have told you in other lectures, that after the Crusades, uh, the returning Crusaders and the Templars and many other groups brought back to Europe a great deal of wisdom from the Near East. Also the rise of Moorish culture in Spain resulted in a liberation of the human mind and a return of lines and departments of knowledge hitherto long removed from European civilization and culture. We know that all through this transition period, secret societies originating in antiquity and perpetuated quietly but strenuously by certain individuals did move beneath the surface of European life and politics. These societies, striving for survival and also for that major purpose, which was the liberation of the human mind, continue to operate uh, quietly but effectively, as we know from the stories of the troubadours, the guilds, and many other groups. Now, as far as it is possible to determine, alchemy was devised as a means of perpetuating a secret kind of knowledge under the symbolism of chemistry. Now, why was chemistry chosen? Let us read the reply by asking another question. Why did the Dionysians and later Masonic organizations use architecture for exactly the same purpose? In other words, we know uh, that the Dionysians believed that the building of a temple was the symbol symbolization of the building of society and of the human soul. But at a time when it seemed advisable to move in secrecy, the active properties of the esoteric law were concealed under appropriate figures and devices. And just as the building of Solomon's temple came to mean the building of human society, so the transmutation of metals came to mean the transmutation of the personal and collective life of humanity. The symbolism was a joy. Because the alchemists had hit upon a basic truth, namely that all departments of nature can be brought under one general pattern. And any science thoroughly understood is a key to nearly all other forms of learning. Thus in alchemy, the entire weight of an important philosophical system was trusted to chemistry and chemical chemistry. We may say that this was suitable and proper for the reason that against this symbolism there was no well-integrated body of opposition. And these philosophers revealed themselves as philosophers, they would have been persecuted. Had they advanced their ideas on a religious level, they would have been executed. Had they attempted to develop psychological training, they would probably have fallen victim uh, to the Inquisition. But as chemists, they had several appeals. First of all, medicine, and the chemical sciences were accepted by theology. They were accepted as necessary, and the uh, church had no direct opposition to the advancement of medical science. It did not accept it particularly, but it accepted it. The second thing is that this symbolism strangely intrigued the covetousness of the human mind. During the rise of alchemical symbolism, many princes, powerful leaders of both church and state, hired and maintained alchemists and carried elaborate research programs because alchemy promised to transmute base metal into gold and to discover the universal medicine and the elixir of life. And there wasn't a rogue in Europe who didn't want to live longer. And there wasn't a king in Europe who did not want additional funds in the treasury. <laughs> so um, the appeal to the cupidity and the selfishness of mankind helped to protect the alchemist from persecution. He had hit upon a wonderful formula. And even though he did suffer to some degree from the greed of princes, still for the most part he was hated to and pamphlet. And we remember the street of the gold makers in Prague, in Czechoslovakia, where a whole colony of these alchemists worked together for a number of years under the princes of Bohemia and other royal patrons. Now, it must have been rather interesting to realize that these alchemists were supported, maintained, <coughs> and nursed along uh, by the very tyrants who alchemy 
As soon as this had been properly taken care of, this community, created by these workmen, held a section, elected its own officers, created its own mayor, or in this case, master of the work, his assistants to prepare the work of the day and to lay out the program for all of the other workmen. So these men and their community lived completely apart <coughs> from the rest of the country in which they lived. And as the records of the time show, they did not even follow in the religion of the community. These people had their own religion. And several early fathers, writing of these communities of builders, shook their heads sadly over their quills and said that we think that some of them were not as good orthodox Christians as they should have been. <laughs> it's quite possible because from the Near East came men who worked in silk and fabrics, came covers of stones and gems. From North Africa came men skilled in design and artistry. From Bulgaria, Romania, from the great Slavic states, from all parts of Europe they came, Christian, Muslim, Jew, everything you can think of, but all bound together by the great guilds into which they uh, had been initiated. These guilds created their own world. They created their own cooperatives. They had their own ways of taking care of the widows and the fatherless. They took care of their own sick. They brought their own physicians. They did everything, and they created a form of government which we call today democracy. And that democracy began within the structure of the guilds. Now, if you attended a great meeting of the guild masters, you would attend something that was very interesting. You would find these men gathered in <coughs> the communion house or in the community center. And here, on certain intervals, prescribed by their laws and their traditions, they broke bread together. And because not one of these was greater than another, they were seated around a circular table and in the midst of the table was the gill cup. And this gill cup had on the, on the lip, all around the edge of the cup, little hooks. And on each of these hooks was the crest and shield of a gill master. This cup was filled with wine, and each of the masters drank from the cup, performing a ritualistic Eucharist, and rededicating their lives to the great service of the architects of the universe. They were worshipping and building. Their laws were their own. Their secrets were inviolate. Their mysteries were perpetuated. And the power of these men can well be imagined when we realize, for example, that a few days after he placed his famous bow on the church door, Martin Luther, who was by an instance a guildsman, because he belonged to the guild of the watchmakers. Soon after he had uh, made his public statement against the sale of papal indulgences, Luther was called before his guild. <clears throat> and here in solemn assembly, he was placed under the protection of the guilds and given a medal, which was always wear, and which he should show in time of emergency. And from that time on, although Luther had a hard time, he was under the protection of this body and was one of the few of the great reformers of the period who survived. The guilds were very powerful. Now here is a guild if we know definitely, it was dedicated to building buildings, but we also know from the inscriptions which they placed upon the stones, from the mysterious carvings they hid far in recondite places in the masonry, from their wonderful use of emblems and figures, that they were more than just them. They were the perpetuation of the secret schools of architecture, known as the Dionysian Artificers in Greece, the Vitruvian Collegia in Rome, and the famous architects called the Cobacene Builders, who had their refuge in Lake Como. These were all initiate schools from antiquity, concealing the secrets of human regeneration under the story of architecture. Now here's one group of guilds. Now let us pass for a moment to another group. And this is the group of the chemists. The doctors, the chemists, and those who had to do with research in metals, metallurgy, the things of that nature. All who touched fire as a means of working the elements of their craft were bound together. And this mysterious body of chemists, although it did not build cities at the foot of cathedrals and do things of that nature, was an integrated body. And it was also in close relation to the crafts of the builders. 
After a great deal of research, I was finally able to recover ancient drawings of the original doors of the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris. The reason this was important was that the original doors, which were removed at the time of the French Revolution, that these doors, which were cast in bronze, and I suppose to have been the work of the devil, all such interesting things were at that time. <laughs> All these doors was the complete failure of alchemical transmutation. The doors were a mass of hermetic symbols. Now these doors could not have been placed there by the chemists, unless these chemists had also been in very intimate association with the cathedral builders. It was part of the same type of guild. Another guild that is of very great interest to us is the bookmakers' guild, the printers. And if you study the columns and trade emblems and symbols of the great presses like Gutenberg and Fust and Caxton, you will find that each one of these presses had its master's mark, and that these book builders and makers were also bound together in a fraternity, which is the reason why it was possible through the medieval and early modern period for ciphers and secret devices of all kinds to be introduced into books. This could not have taken place had it not been for the guilds, this tremendous body of men who were bound together by a common purpose. And that common purpose was the restoration of the golden age in the world. <coughs> now, when we go directly and strictly into the alchemical symbolism, we come upon a number of intimations. And in order to trace these intimations, we have to go step by step to an inconceivable labyrinth of clues and hints and implications. We know, for example, that the term adept, as we know it in the West, is first applied to the alchemical masters. As the various building crafts elected a grand master, the alchemists elected or appointed or accepted into their bodies certain masters of their arts, whom they call adepts. Now, to me, this term has a very special and definite meaning. It should not be confused with the Eastern or Oriental concept of adept, or even the Rosicrucian or mystical concept. The adept was the master alchemist, or one fully possessed of the mysteries of the art. Now, in the build of craft, you have the masters, the fellow craft, and the apprentices. In the alchemical guild, you have the adept, the illuminate, and the initiate. Those were the three degrees. And uh, these represented those who had attained to one or two or even the third step of knowledge <coughs> concerning the mysteries of chemistry. The adepts gathering together in the performance of their equivalent to the master bills of Eucharist, gathering around the great gill cup, which in this case was the wonderful Alembic of alchemy. Also appointed their ruler, who was called the Adept King. And then one of the very rare tracts, which is almost unobtainable, uh, states that in alchemy there was the King Emperor, the supreme ruler of the entire school scattered throughout the world, that under him were the princes of the blood, the highest adept masters. Below them were the dukes, the earls, the barons, the knights, and the squires of this hierarchy. And therefore it was customary to refer to a certain alchemist as a duke or as an earl, depending upon his place in this great mysterious empire which existed in a strange dimension extending through all other empires and binding them together by a strange level of traditions. Now, material relating to this, as I have said, is exceedingly hard to find. We find a few references in, of it, uh, to it in Kura, a very early alchemical master. And we also find references to it in a work called the Addicts in alchemy. A very interesting and early work. But uh, in wandering through one of the old libraries of Europe, <coughs> I was able to find this manuscript, 
which perhaps comes a little nearer to some of this problem than we will find in anywhere else. And as far as I'm able to find out, this is the only copy of it that exists. And this is called The True Adept Illuminates and Initiates of the Hermetic Arts. This is in the form of a kind of uh, biographical uh, glossary. It is almost in the form of a certain biographical who's who in alchemy. And from the first page of this, we learn the definitions as they were used within the body of the alchemical school. The term addict is properly applied to one who has learned the great work and who has performed it. That is the proper term for an addict. The term illuminate or illuminist is probably related to one who has experienced the mystery of the work but does not know how it is performed. This is a rather curious uh, differentiation. The term initiate is one who has achieved to the knowledge of the method but has not performed the work. Now this uh, is the way in which the guild of the chemists was divided. Following this is a list prefaced by the fact that it must always and ever be remembered that there are false addicts, false illuminates, and false initiates. But that the genuine ones can be determined only by those who have the knowledge to investigate the secret marks and symbols. Then we have here a list of the adepts of the school, both imaginary and historical, and also the degrees of their development within the school. We learn from this book, for instance, that according to the alchemical tradition, Moses was an adept. We learn the Solomon was an addict. And this brings us very close to the fact that Solomon was also supposed to have been a great architect and a master of those mysteries. Then we learn also, as we go on uh, through these lists, some of the other names involved in this. The Apostle John, a sublime illuminator. Hermes, an adept. Orpheus, an adept. Apollonius of Rhodes, an initiate. Homer, an initiate. Ptolemy, an illuminate. Virgil, an initiate. You can go right down through this book and you will find all of the principal names and their ranks in the school. We also learn that Avicenna was an initiate. Albert the Great, Albertus Magnus, was an adept. St. Thomas Aquinas was an initiate. Roger Bacon was an initiate. Raymond Looney was an adept. I won't try to read them all because many of the names are not particularly important to us now. But this work carries on through all of the different steps of alchemy, pointing out that these different teachers, masters of the schools, were actually bound together in a pattern. Now when we take an alchemical tradition and we come to the discovery that it includes Orpheus and Homer, we know that we are not dealing with chemistry because these men were not chemists. We were dealing with an esoteric system of which the alchemical schools in Europe were comparatively recent development. Clearly, an illuminate. Michael Meyer, in the class. One of the interesting things we find as we go along through here 
is that a number of names that are a little better known to us are also to be found if we go near the end of the list. <coughs> we know, for instance, that this list, strangely enough, ends with a comparatively familiar name, and that is Baron Emanuel Swedenborg and Illuminate. Now, when we study Swedenborg and his association with St. Germain and Cagliostro, we have reason to believe that the book is probably correct. But this is, as far as I know, the only who's who of the dramatic <laughs> addict. <laughs> but the principle behind it is that the entire work was an integration, was a definite system devised for a purpose. And that purpose was concealed under a series of alchemical or magical symbols and devices, the meanings of which we will try to explain at least in part as this series progresses. Now the next thing that uh, I want to bring up in connection with the alchemical tradition is to try to orient what basically alchemy stood for. <laughs> Generally and broadly we know what it meant. We know that by transmutation was implied regeneration. We also know that the symbolism of alchemy was exact. Why? Because it was based upon an exact science, chemistry. We also realize that as we go into it, that perhaps the nearest parallel that we can find to it in our common experience in the modern world is yoga. In other words, alchemy was an esoteric discipline was a discipline based upon an exact science of human regeneration. Now, just as in almost all of the exact sciences of antiquity, it is assumed that the keys were lost, and that therefore the mystery of the cult or sect uh, is no longer to be found. And this I question very greatly. The second point that I think we should try to realize and understand is that the alchemists were not only interested in the regeneration of man, but in the restoration of the philosophic empire as established in the concept of Plato. This restoration of the philosophic empire was to be undertaken by a broad political program. <coughs> So alchemy penetrated and permeated practically every political and social state of the world, extending as far as China, throughout India, throughout the Near East, and even extending into the Central and South American areas of the Western Hemisphere, where chemistry had reached a fairly high degree of proficiency. Around the alchemical speculation, as it is, we have developed a great number of overtones. And these overtones can best be understood by reference perhaps to some of the alchemists themselves. Following this list, and only using approved members of the uh, <coughs> group, uh, the aristocrats of the order, we find, for example, uh, that certain alchemists are more reliable, more careful, and obviously more informed than others. Among the best and greatest informed of these adept alchemists was Raymond Lewis. Another one highly proficient of skill was Bacillus Valentinus, book of St. Benedict. A third very highly efficient one was George Ripley, the English chemist. And then four equally at least uh, recognized and remembered for his important contributions to the subject, was Michael Sendavogius. These were among the great names in alchemy. Therefore, when we read them, taking a work such as the Triumphant Chariot of Antimonium uh, by Basil Valentine, we come always upon lines like this, woe, woe, woe unto the gold makers. And another line in Ripley which says that whoever believes that the transmutation of physical metals at the end of alchemy is a fool. All these things are tossed in. Very little is made up because at that time it was advisable to unveil the secrets too completely. 
But the alchemists themselves have left in their published and other writings irrefutable proof that they were not to be considered merely as chemists, that they were to be considered as the instruments of a secret purpose and art, and that this art they had inherited or brought down from a remote antiquity. The alchemical symbolism itself was very recent, but the method or mystery behind it uh, was very old. The second and uh, another important point is that the alchemical tradition moving into Europe Christianized itself intensely. But this Christianization was no part of its original symbolism. Gradually, therefore, we find the introduction of Christian figures and symbols into the alchemic arts. But wherever they are used, they are used in a purely alchemical sense, not in the sense of theology. Just as the uh, mystical symbols of astrology and magic used by Bailey were not to be used in the magical <coughs> astrological sense, but in a purely mystical sense, a matter which has been of considerable concern uh, to students of the subject. One of the main names associated with early alchemy was Paracelsus von Hohenheim. And uh, this great Swiss physician tells us that he was initiated into the mysteries of the spiritual art of chemistry by masters of these arts, of this art, in Constantinople. And that it was among the Muslims that he gained his first great knowledge of the secrets of transcendent chemistry. In all probability, he studied with the Dervishes and other Eastern groups who had under another symbolism, the symbolism in some cases of music or song or poetry, had come to the same as with the famous troubadours and the Triad of Bronsard in France. All of these groups were bound together. Dante's Inferno was not intended to be a literal description of the uh, netherworld. Milton's Paradise Lost was not intended merely to be a story based upon a great religious fantasy. These things were tied together. They were part of a pattern and if you had the key, you could unlock the pattern. If you did not have the key, it remained hopelessly a mystery to you. But to possess the key you was to have a knowledge of the transcendental arts and all that they imply in the uh, system of alchemical speculation. Two names I'd like to mention specially connected with the problem of alchemy this evening. One is the French alchemist, Nicolas Spanel. The story of Flamel is almost unbelievable. He was a poor man who made his living by writing documents and acting as a notary. On one of his, in one of his experiences, wandering around, he found a mysterious book, which was called the Book of Abraham the Jew. This book was written upon tablets of some mysterious fiber-like substance. And it contained only a certain number of leaves, and on these leaves were the entire formulas of the transmutations of metals. Flamel studied these leaves very carefully for a number of years, and finally hit upon the formula. And as a result of having found the formula, he built a, a number of institutions for the poor, orphanages and churches and chapels in France, and finally caused the entire formula to be carved in beautiful designs upon the arches of the Church of the Innocents in Paris. When I was in Paris just before the war, I went in search of the Church of the Innocents. Unfortunately, it has departed from us. And where it, not, and where it once stood is now a small and almost deserted park. I happened to be able to get hold of the gardener or caretaker who watched this park, and he told me that every so often that they when they were uh, planting and weeding and uh, making a little flower beds to look as best as they could, uh, they would pick up bones from the old cemetery of the Church of the Innocents. And then a number of stones and a number of inscribed sections from the church had been taken into the courtyard of the Cunet Museum in Paris, where they stood around in various places. I went over there and looked them over. Some of them still showed sections of the alchemical designs of Nicholas Pamel. Uh, this mysterious man uh, was persecuted uh, terrifically to, to gain the secret from him, but never divulged it. And is said finally to have gone to Asia, 
where he lived for a great length of time in company with dervishes and other mystics. He was quite a remarkable person, but a wonderful story about him could easily be written. Another interesting personality in the tradition of Alfred is uh, the mysterious character Elias Adepta, the king of the Adepts. Uh, he shows up once in a while, but uh, has the same elusiveness as the mysterious character of the wandering Jew. The adept king is described in some detail in one or two alchemical works. He is said to have lived forever, to have spoken every language in the world. And it was his peculiar habit to wander about Europe in disguise, always appearing in the costume of the country which he visited always appearing to conform with his laws and customs, appearing at will and disappearing at will. And the story of Elias Adepta is one of the most fantastic in the entire uh, circle of metaphysical literature. A typical example of the story of uh, Elias Adepta will be found in the writings of men like Sandalogius, an alchemist working in his laboratory struggling desperately, very devout, very sincere, very noble man. He finally came to the point where he could no longer find any further clues to the mysterious search which he was advancing. He came to the point where there were no longer any answers. He did not know what to do next. He had done everything that he could think of and conceive of, and had studied and worked and labored and prayed and meditated and gone as far as he could. In this emergency, it was not uncommon for a knock to be heard on the front door of his house. A mysterious man would come in. And he would go to the laboratory of the chemist and sit down and talk to him for a few moments, and then tell him what to do. And then uh, when asked who he was, he would probably smile and say, oh, just a wandering chemist who kind of had an idea to give a little advice at this time. Um, would walk out the door and never be seen or heard of again. Uh, gradually, the uh, records of this mysterious wanderer uh, gained uh, proportions. And for over 200 years, the story of Elias Adepta, wandering about Europe, is to be found in choice archives in this field of research. And one of, in a few cases, he told his name. He was Elias the Adept. He was the mysterious adept king who was to come and to rule over the world. Then he would vanish again, like the mysterious bodhisattvas of Shambhala, not to be seen or heard of anymore. As these stories build and as the legends accumulate, the parallels between this concept and that of the Oriental mysteries become very obvious. And we know that we were dealing in Europe with an advanced system of speculation and art and science, uh, which normally would not have existed and could not have existed, and which had to conceal itself for its own protection. <coughs> Out of the alchemical furor of the 15th and 16th century came the Rosicrucian furor of the early 17th century. And let us remember definitely that all uh, opinion and uh, prejudice to the contrary, that there was no evidence of the existence of Rosicrucianism in Europe prior to the year 1610. That the story like that of alchemy has a much older origin, but that this origin is fantasy, is legend, lore, symbolism, all that we will accept. But actually, this society, which combined certain hermetic and alchemical factors with those of other sciences of the time, such as Kabbalism, magic, actually came into existence about 1610. Nearly all of the alchemists then flourishing in Europe, became immediately involved in this new heresy, the Brotherhood of the Rosy Cross. It also was frankly short-lived and elusive. And there are a number of accounts of Rosicrucian adepts, including one who whistled rats out of houses, but we won't take them too seriously. <laughs> in the first ten years of Rosicrucian excitement, after the publication of the Bible and Confessio Fertilitatis, about 900 books were written dealing with the subject by persons who knew nothing about it whatsoever. <laughs> Many of these books were in the form of open letters, published at the expense of the author in stating his own qualifications and asking a brother of the society to contact him in some way. 
because he had no way of contacting the society itself. Naturally, most of these letters and open epistles were ignored. No one has ever been able to find out who the dominant persons were behind this movement any more than that of the original alchemy. But that they all sprang from a common root, that they all had certain works in common, we cannot doubt. That they fulfilled a very useful function in the unfoldment of the European mind is also quite definite and evident. Now, from this general survey, which is naturally exceedingly brief, but which only touches a few of the interesting phases of it, I want to try to start a series of rather brief definitions of some of the elements of alchemy as we have to contact them and work with them uh, in the future. First of all, alchemy, as we say, has three steps or degrees of adepts. One being the adept himself, one the illuminate, and one the initiate. It likewise had three great works or achievements uh, with, with which it was concerned primarily under the title or general collective term, the magnum opus, or the great work. The first and supreme work of the alchemist was the formation or the production by art and genius of the philosopher's stone, the lapis philosophorum. Now, the creation of the philosopher's stone was associated identically with the adept himself. Uh, the adept, or the master of the school, and the philosopher's stone parallel. In other words, the adept and the stone had something uh, in common, almost something in identity. The second work of the great school of alchemy was the uh, transmutation of base metal. This, the uh, formation of physical chemistry for the production of synthetic minerals and metals, uh, was as, uh, associated with the third step in the uh, cycle, namely the initiate. In other words, the initiate was the transmuter of metals. The illuminist, who was between these two, was identified with the search for the universal medicine. So we have the three steps in relationship to the three grades. The creation of the stone being the work of the addict. The discovery of the universal medicine being the work of the illuminate and the transmutation of base metals being the work of the initiate. These three men represented the keys to the works of the grades, or differentiated the labors of the three classes or orders of alchemists. Uh, the transmutation of base metal into gold was the work of science. Uh, the creation of the universal medicine was the work of philosophy. The, for the casting of the lapis philosophorum, or the great stone, was the work of religion. Thus, religion, philosophy, and science were the three grades, as in almost all of the great mystical things, uh, schools and systems. The first grade was, of course, the grade of the spirit, the second, the grade of the soul, and the third, the grade of the body. Thus the body was the transmuter of minerals, the soul, the discoverer of the medicine, and the spirit, the precipitator of the stone. Von Welling, the great German adept, gives us a very definite series of definitions, indicating that these accomplishments conceal the rituals, rites, and secret ceremonies of the grades. And the therefore, under the heading, for instance, of the transmutation of metals, uh, we have an interesting symbolism. The alchemist represented metals under usually seven symbols. These seven symbols being identical with the planetary symbols of astrology. Thus, for instance, lead with Saturn, iron with Mars, and so on. These were the base metals. And they were formed together in the form of a six-point star composed of two interlaced triangles, and in the center, a seventh point. So that the six points on the points of the stars and the seventh in the center constituted the seven metals. Now, the alchemists 
also drew this as described in the Septium Bill in the form of seven of these six-pointed star patterns arranged in a circle like a wreath. In each one, a different symbol of a different metal was in the center, and the other six surrounded it on the points of the stars. Each one, therefore, told us the simple point that the alchemist himself laid out, namely that each one of the metals contains all the others. Now, if we take the points of the metals and we change these into the seven liberal arts and sciences, we shall then have a key to the great social reform of the transmutational level of alchemy. In other words, your seven metals are the seven departments of human society. They are the seven arts and sciences. They represent the seven races, the seven continents, and all of the great systems of septuagint by which the world, life, and progress are measured. Each of these contains within itself the seeds of all others. And the alchemist says that the seed of universality is within every particular of nature. Every atom contains all the rest. Every center contains a, an infinite circumference locked within its own essential nature. Also, the uh, alchemist pointed out that every base metal contains within itself pure gold. Now, the amount of pure gold contained within any atom or any unique particle of matter might be so slight as to be practically beyond discovery. But alchemy said, you do not create gold, you make it grow. The seed of the divine metal is within all base metals. And that the transmutation of a base substance is not actually <coughs> a change into something that does not previously, uh, did not previously exist, but the release of that which is forever present in all compounds and in all elements. So that alchemy is the nourishing and the feeding of the seed of gold in everything. The outer forms of these arts and sciences to remain unregenerated. Thus, in the field of learning, alchemy is the regeneration of arts and sciences, not by reforming them, essentially, but by releasing through them the seed of truth, which is locked in each one of them, to make the seed grow, to accomplish the mysterious multiplications of the mango seed, like the uh, fabled legend of Indian magic, was the problem of alchemy. Now, in the transmutation of metals, another important point was brought out, and that is that the outer bodies of the metals are irreconcilable. Therefore, that you cannot force iron and lead together and cause them to accomplish an alchemical mystery. You can fuse them to produce an alloy of some kind, but you cannot force them together to release their own spiritual power. Therefore, before metals or elements can be given a new birth in the spirit of must die. And the death of elements, the destruction of minerals, the complete elimination of the formal nature of the forms of things uh, is part of the alchemical procedure. Therefore, alchemy was a death and a resurrection and comes very, very close to philosophical symbolism as we come to this level. All of the outer bodies and structures of metals must die before the spirits of these metals can unite to form uh, the mysterious transmuting agent, which is called the Red Lion. This again has very great uh, significance, and the alchemist finds comfort in the words of the scripture, but unless a man be born again, he shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. For every one of the forms of nature must die before the life within that form can be liberated or released. 
Therefore, alchemy then approaches the problem of human intelligence. And it says that uh, before the individual can become wise, he must destroy the false mind, uh, which presumes to possess knowledge. He must destroy opinions before facts can come. He must tear down old walls before he can build a new house. And in the doctrines of the alchemical mysteries, it was first necessary to destroy the personality or the individuality of metal before they could be brought together to form uh, the transmuting agent. Now in the transmuting agent itself, called the Red Lion, or the power of protection, which was one of the great symbols of alchemy, the master was sent to carry, particularly Elias Adapta, who was the Elias the artist that the uh, master carried with him a little box which contained the powder of projection and that one grain of this powder would transmute into pure gold 100,000 times its own weight in base metals. Here we are obviously in the presence of an advanced type of symbolism because obviously the powder of projection represents consciousness itself all on a level of knowledge truth which transforms ignorance and consciousness itself which can transform body up to 100,000 times its own weight therefore the power of projection is consciousness itself by means of which all base substances can be transformed or changed the red lion is the symbol in alchemy of illumination the mysterious enlightenment from within which is the rebirth of the soul of metals this illumination, according to Alfred, was achieved through the blending of seven arts and sciences, which were the seven sacred arts and sciences of the ancients. <coughs> Thus we proceed in symbolism a little way. We don't want to go too far now because we have to examine these things in greater detail. So we then consider the creation of the universal medicine, which was the work of the illuminists. Now how is this universal medicine to be found? The basis of this medicine goes back into a very ancient symbolism and that is the production of the spirits of metals and the spirits of the spirit of gold which can be captured in wine. Theophrastus Paracelsus explained that in certain parts of Switzerland uh, where there was gold in the soil, <coughs> great vines sending their tendrils and roots into the earth gathered up this gold of all forms of vegetation, the grape is the one which has the greatest affinity to gold. And that is in areas where gold is in the soil. The dead uh, vines of grapes are burned. And the ashes of these, uh, from this burning, are washed. Gold will be found in them. Now if you study this symbolism a little further, you will begin to recognize the peculiar use of the grape, of the wine, of the Eucharist, and of the mysterious symbols of the early Christian church. Uh, the gold which is gathered for the grape is the symbol of, of mystical, ex uh, mystical ecstasy or the mystical experience in man. For well, this experience gathers the available consciousness and you remember that the Christos, or the symbol of the Illuminator and the Initiator, refers to himself by saying, I am the vine. This mysterious vine of life, the great, the symbol of the Dionysian Eucharist, and later brought into the church, is therefore closely associated, as with the brain, with illumination. The universal medicine is the mystical experience arising within the individual. It is the basis of the healing of himself and of all nations, and the bringing about of the power of the healing of all sickness, for sickness is healed by the mystery of grace, and in alchemy the great and the grace are identical in meaning. So we have here a heavy mystical overtone, overshadowing the physical or alchemical symbolism as we generally accept it. We'll find work on this on uh, this subject and the development of it in the work by General Ethan Allen Hitchcock 
of the American Civil War General who gives mysteries of alchemy. Now the lapis philosophorum, or the diamond stone, the diamond soul, uh, also uh, is reminiscent of many, uh, many religious systems. In Tibetan Buddhism, the diamond soul appears as one of the most important symbols of the world deity. In alchemy, the ruby diamond is the, uh, the most important of all the symbols. It is a synthetic stone so made that it has a drop of blood in the center. I have seen in Europe two or three ruby diamonds made by art and nature by our chemical transmutation. We recently have read in the paper that at last a completely synthetic diamond, absolutely perfect, has been discovered. And this undoubtedly is the same basis, basic principle as the idea of alchemy. For this reason, alchemy says very simply, that which occurs psychologically within man will also occur physically in chemistry. In other words, alchemy does not deny that base metals can be transmuted. But it says that the laws used in this are the same laws as those used in the transmutation of man himself. Therefore, if the individual gains the secret art for the transmutation of his own nature, he can also transmute physical substances. Because one set of laws is involved. If, however, he attempts to transmute base metals without having the secret of the transmutation within his own consciousness, he will not only fail to transmute his consciousness, but will be unable to transmute the metals. Many alchemists began their work as experimental chemists. And this brings us another important key to the thing. These experimental chemists began by a sincere and inevitable conviction that they could transmute base metals physically. So they took the writings of the alchemists with their strange descriptions of mysterious monsters, of angels, of black birds, of double-headed phoenixes, of kings and queens, of the celestial hermaphrodite, of the crystal homunculus, and all these other emblems of alchemy. And they began to ponder them, trying to find out how to make them another star. That's how they found out. <laughs> <laughs> they called their family goods. They went out and bought all kinds of equipment from the Olympics and retorts, test tubes and furnaces, and with bowels and artistry they blew and they puffed. Like Titus and Miranda who spent many years working on this subject, but did not arrive, or Eugenia Felicis, who finally was killed by an experiment in his own laboratory. But these artists, struggling to understand the symbols, fighting day by day with the processes in their retorts, gathering their dew of the plates of glass on the various configurations of the constellations, seeking for the gold bearing grapevine, working with the formulas, studying the designs and symbols. These very physical chemists, as uh, Michael Sendemogius tells us, who was one of them, started with this simple intent to transmute base metals to become rich. But they hadn't gone very far when something began to happen to them. They began to find within themselves a realization that they were too limited in their own perspective. As they went along in their researches, they found they depended upon faculties keener than those of mere reading. One of the simplest things they had to face was the problem of trying to find out what the author had concealed behind these strange devices. These devices became meditation wheels. They became like list mandalas. They began to challenge the individual who studied them. <clears throat> and as months went on and years went on, and this individual went further and further into the arts, he began to sense within himself other dimensions that he had not previously considered. And after he had been working more than 10 years in his laboratory, Sandavuja suddenly came to the realization that alchemy was not a physical science, but a spiritual one. He discovered himself. <laughs> it grew on him, so to say. He learned step by step through the unfoldment of his own faculties. He found then that this mysterious twisting road that led through the symbols was a constant coaxing of something out of himself. 
he finally grew to be so intuitive that he could read between the lines. And as he began to read between the lines, he began to see the larger dimensions of the art. Until at last, he cried out in, in dismay and distress to think that he had wasted so much time on the outer shadow of something that was so much more important than he had originally believed. Gradually, he found that the study of these symbols released something out of his own nature. And he began to sense the real mysteries of alchemy. <coughs> so we have another definition that has to sink in somewhere along the line, and might what's up here right now. Namely, that the initiate is the intellect. That the illuminate <coughs> is the intuition and that the adeptus is the consciousness, and that they're all inside of himself and all his world. But the alchemical adept is the mysterious power of consciousness operating through will and yoga. And that every human being is his own adept. And that Elias Artista, the master of the adept, who appears and disappears without leaving trace, coming when he is most needed, disappearing no one knows where, represents these flashes of consciousness by which the individual suddenly and briefly senses his own internal. But there is something within himself that does not respond to his demands, but somehow responds to his needs. Elias the artist is his own consciousness. The great fire of alchemy is his own will, by means of which these mysteries are wrought. The illuminance is his own psychic nature, particularly his intuitional and inspirational part. And the initiate is his mind, uh, which can always know the secret but can never experience it. So the adept himself, in all his parts, is the alchemist, growing step by step through the experiences of his own art. As we recognize these principles gradually coming more and more clearly to us, we also can go on further. Uh, in the alchemical transmutation, we have a bottle. It's a very interesting bottle. It's a kind of a bulgy bottle with a long, sometimes a rather long neck. And within this bottle are a number of strange devices, one of the more common and frequent of which is a peacock with an extended tail in many iridescent colors. And the uh, initiate seeking the stone is told to watch for the appearance of the peacock's tail in the bottle. In the emblems of Solomon Tristolson, called the Splendor Solus, we have a good many examples of this wonderful adventure taking place in a glass bottle. This was called the Hermetic Womb in the rites and in the ancient mysteries. And this undoubtedly has one very simple meaning. This glass bottle is the human soul. And it is within this soul that the mystery of the seven transmutations takes place. Now I remember in the last series when we were talking about yoga. I pointed out the importance of recognizing that the human soul corresponds with the orbits of the seven planets, and that the soul of man represents the seal of the seven cardinal virtues, the seven deadly sins, which reflect downward into the physical phenomena of the seven liberal arts and sciences. Therefore, the second part of the work, the work of the illuminant, takes place within the soul and the bottle it must contain the universal medicine. Now this universal medicine is achieved through the mystery of the seven parts of the human soul, a doctrine which originally originated probably in Egypt, where there is specific reference to the seven souls of man and how they in turn influence the destiny of his life. Now when we get up into the higher level of the adeptus, we also begin to see this cut down with its various facets and symbols. And the further we go into that diamond and the study of it, the closer we get to the great geometric solids of Plato and Pythagoras. The diamond is a symbol of a symmetrical geometric solid, the sign of the perfect form in nature. 
The diamond soul is itself, of course, a symbol of the universe. It is a symbol of consciousness. It is a symbol of spirit. It is a symbol of the perfect power which is released or made possible or available to man through regeneration. Now all these different elements become more than mere hints. We must accept them as hints. We must work with them as best we can until we gain more and more knowledge of them. Now in also in alchemy you have another mysterious symbolism which is called uh, the Ladder of the Sages or Homer's Golden Chain uh, which binds uh, the ship of life to the pinnacle of Olympus. Homer's Golden Chain is a sequence of seven interlocking elemental symbols by means of which spirit and body are united. The soul is therefore the symbol of union. And that comes out of this another great and important element. And that is the rise of the term Hermetic. Hermetic is associated with the later Egyptian divinity Hermes, who belongs to the period of the Gnostic revivals in North Africa, is a very mysterious being around whom the great vision of the primary of Hermes has been compiled. So we use the word hermetic today to symbolize something that is sealed so that air cannot get in. It's hermetically sealed jars or bottles. And this is again a reference to alchemy. Hermes was the patron of alchemy, which was also referred to as the hermetic art. Now Hermes carries always the caduceus or the winged staff. He's represented with wings on his heels and wings on his hat, and usually dressed somewhat in the garb of a Roman soldier. He's a kind of a, an effective looking little fellow in his own way, but very few uh, students have really given him a great deal of thought. Now Mercury, in the old astrological symbolism, has to do with the intellect, and to a certain degree it still has that relation in, uh, in alchemy, because mind unites spirit and body. Mind is the link between man as an internal and man as an external being. So the mind man expresses into himself from environment, and through the mind man expresses the inner nature of his own consciousness. <coughs> Thus mind is a common ground within himself. Uh, but the alchemists use mind much more in the sense that we use the psyche or the soul. For to them it included both male and female attributes, and represented a psychic field or pattern. And Mercury was therefore the common solvent or quicksilver, by which all metals could be united or brought into synthesis. Mercury was the absorbing power, so that actually, according to their doctrine, the Philosopher's Stone was composed of the union of salt, mercury, and sulfur. Sulfur representing consciousness or spirit, salt representing earth or body, and <coughs> mercury representing mind or the solvent. In this symbolism, using the Hermetic analogy, we come upon a number of very interesting and important parallels or elements, <coughs> each of which we will gradually develop along with other symbols. Mercury now emerges as something that unites or forms a common ground, absorbing into itself things otherwise irreconcilable. Let us try to understand that in terms of human experience in something that is familiar to us. What is there about us as beings? Or what faculty of power do we possess by which we can reconcile opposites? By which we can bind together through experience things held differently or regarded as irreconcilable in nature or quality? What is this most mysterious and absorbing agent? Uh, the Greeks and later the Hermetists and the alchemists declared that the psychic field of man <coughs> was capable of accepting from above spiritual powers and reducing them uh, to the level of mind and emotion and that this also the soul was able to cause bodily elements and external phenomena to ascend into this middle zone and be absorbed into soul quality so that the soul was the common denominator, the link, uh, the common field into which both spirit and matter passed and in which they seemed to die, to be reborn again as one body or being. 
So we can say that in the in, in the Hermetic allegory, consciousness, which is the spiritual power, descending into the field of Mercury or into the soul, manifests itself as intellect and uh, intuition. Whereas bodily elements or energies ascending into the soul also took on an attribute or aspect of intellect and intuition. So that they took on an overtone and were reconciled in this field. And that therefore man through a kind of experience within himself achieved and calculated in which he transmuted the opposites of his own nature and caused them to become one being within the sphere of soul power. So we have the, uh, the formula, very simple. Uh, we have the king and queen, uh, which are spirit and body, or God and nature, producing the homunculus, or the crystal creature, which is man. Man, therefore, is Hermes. Man is the unifier. Man is the personification of the principle of the Hermetic medicine. In man, <coughs> have a very common goal. In man, the divine and the human are brought together in one structure. In man, all opposite <coughs> nature meet. And in man, in his own nature and in his own existence, in his own attitude, the creation of the diamond soul is made possible. Thus, there need or there need of man. Man, composed of certain powers and faculties, particularly the seven powers of the soul. These seven powers of the soul being the basis of the harmony or synthesis by which the divine and the human, or the divine and the mortal, are brought together. Thus man becomes the potential alchemist. So we have in the old symbolism, heaven, earth, and the alchemist. Now uh, we find many such symbols Heaven represented as a divine being. Earth represented as a wonderful fecundity of life. The king and queen again. Holding between them man, who is the potential addict, who is the potential redeemer of all things and the transmuter of the universe in which he is placed. Now this heaven earth man being begins to bring another uh, point into consideration which we have in alchemy. So we have a, a trinity of terms which are going to be found in certain of the old alchemical ABC books, as they are called, the ABC Darian writings of early alchemy. And here we have God, nature, and art. Now alchemy was called art. And it was called art in a definition which says, an art perfects nature. Alchemy says, there are no miracles to be performed by art. Art merely anticipates nature and achieves its greatest work by becoming a handmaid of nature. Uh, Bacon, the English philosopher, refers to art as the power to perfect nature through intelligent cooperation. So art becomes the symbol of alchemy. In nature, all things are growing. All things are unfolding their life. And all things are moving inevitably and victoriously towards perfection or towards the state of pure and complete being. But the path is slow. The means are continuous. And the achievements are imperceptible at any given time. Now, in a field of man's researches, such as horticulture, for example, comes along a person like Luther Burbank, or a man like Dr. Carver, who begins to fulfill the alchemical elements of art perfects nature. Burbank became a great student of plant life, and he finally learned how to use the laws governing plant life to hasten the growth of plants. He didn't break any laws. He didn't perform any miracles. He simply used knowledge and helped the plant to help itself. This is art, which is man's voluntary cooperation with the plan of life. The plan will be perfected without man, but it will take millions of years. Man will perfect himself 
over a great period of experience by trial and error. Man will go on suffering and dying until he learns how to live. This is the long road. He will continue to make mistakes, will learn ultimately the laws governing his own conduct, and in the fullness of time will learn to keep those laws. But man may also do many things. He may learn how to work with laws. He may learn that through his own voluntary cooperation, he can make things grow more rapidly. Through will, wisdom, and discipline, he can make himself grow more rapidly. Not by performing a miracle, but by cooperating with nature. So we find alchemy defined as the servant of nature. Not a magician waving a wand, but a gardener working with a spade in the garden. And in the opening sections of Michael Myers, one of his books, we have alchemy as the gardener uh, working with a spade, uh, very carefully cultivating around the rose bush. There's no description given, but they're not necessary. This is art the gardener, making possible the more immediate and perfect growth of the flower. The rose, of course, is all the heroes love and our process for the human soul. So, soul gardening is an art. And the alchemist is the gardener in this great and mysterious garden of the metals. So we find around the gardener growing on various trees symbols of all the metals. He is a gardener working in the field of the metals. He is making them to grow. The artist also is the gardener working in the garden of his own soul, making it to grow, releasing the seven powers and faculties which are exoterically represented by the seven senses of man, <coughs> unfolding all the potentials there, keeping faith with the law, making the law to reveal itself through working with it to following its own rules and causing the law to fulfill itself more immediately through obedience. Another symbolism appropriate to the idea is the gardener weeding his garden. He has valuable plants there which he wishes to protect. Therefore, he takes away the weeds. He uh, fertilizes the ground. He cultivates it and makes it possible for his precious plants to grow better. Now also we find the garden sometimes symbolized as a little fenced in enclosure in which, as like as not, you will find two animals, a lion and a unicorn. And we all remember the good old earthly ride, the lion and the unicorn fighting for the crown. And you'll find that the lion and the unicorn bring suits on the supporters to crest the Great Britain, the British Empire. The unicorn is a very wonderful creature. With one horn in its form, made like a horse. The unicorn is a very, very sensitive and delicate animal and always likes to be uh, around kindly people. The unicorn will very patiently and lovingly follow the mysterious virgin of the world, Sophia, who is the only one that can put a bridle on it. This is a, a very interesting bit of symbolism also, because what is one horn but one pointed? And what is one pointed except will or consciousness itself? Therefore, the unicorn represents the power of will, the conscious will of the individual. The lion, of course, the red lion, we know to be the symbol of the, of the mystery or of the, uh, of the great powder of transmutation of perception. Uh, we know that the lion, in this case, represents wisdom. The will and wisdom captured in the God can accomplish great and wonderful things. Because the struggle of will and wisdom seeking for the crown, of course, the crown is Kethar, the symbol in the, in the Hebrew Kabbalah of the supreme power, of the supreme reality of all things, uh, the crown of power and rulership. There are many, many uses of alchemical symbolism in other departments of living. Uh, we also find, for example, uh, in the alchemical uh, doctrine, constant references to uh, various symbols used in the Bible. We find, for instance, that the complete transmutation and the production of the mysterious universal medicine is believed to be contained within the uh, Canticles of Solomon. In other words, the Song of the Solomon contains the complete formula for the production of universal medicine. And the alchemist can break it down and show you word for word, line for line, how that follows through the various 
uh, researching the various cycles of transmutation. Another very important biochemical formula is said to be concealed in the Lord's Prayer. Now the alchemists who recognize that that is true were telling two stories at one time. They were telling that they had found that the Lord's Prayer was an exact example of psychochemistry. But they were also telling you that the end of psychic chemistry was the achievement of the spiritual state represented for the Lord's Prayer. It worked both ways. And that also, that the state of holiness, or piety, or the state of prayerful contemplation of reality, was the alchemical transmutation. That the transmutation of fear into faith, for example, was the overcoming, overcoming of the black symbol of vitriol. All these things work out on moral and ethical levels. The only difference between them and our general concept of knowledge lies in the exactitude of the symbol. For example, the alchemist says that the sun in the air, in the sky, that it is represented in the earth by gold. Therefore, the gold and the sun are the same thing exactly in vibratory principle. And that the gold in the earth and the sun in the sky are polarized uh, to the pulse point in the human heart. And therefore, that the human heart, the sun and gold, are all <coughs> in sympathetic ratio to each other. And that they are of an identical and proper nature. And that they have certain powers in common. Dr. Lake, Dr. Rudolf Steiner and his researches in Switzerland in connection with the use of the talismanic metals of the ancients in healing disease discovered what we have also learned later by other means, namely that uh, portable gold or what we might term uh, biological gold is a heart remedy. And that a similar gold goes directly into the walls of the heart. Thus, the sympathy that was represented in alchemy was recognized as an existing fact in nature. And that these different principles all work together. Now, the same thing was true with other parts of the universe. Everything that was morally true was scientifically true. If it is true, for example, that wisdom is better than ignorance, that can be proved on terms of chemistry. It can be proved in terms of music, in color, in tone, in sound, in everything. That all values that exist ethically also exist scientifically. And that the polarities of all the elements are to be found, found in the moral and spiritual life of the individual. And that which constitutes a good life also constitutes an exact working formula for a chemical compound. Now just as surely as man is able to integrate certain patterns in his own living, the laws governing these patterns are exactly the same as those used in architecture. And a, and a happy, harmonious, well-integrated home can be mathematically diagrammed, and the diagram will be the perfect structure for a building. This is what Leonardo meant by certain of his patterns. In other words, there is a dynamic which extends from one level of life to another. The Pythagoras knew that if you played a certain chord of music, uh, that this chord in its mathematical vibration could, and could be and was equivalent to the basic key to the structure of a building, the basic key to a chemical compound, a basic formula in law, everything. All these things work together constantly. Therefore, if you have a perfect method of purifying a metal, you have a perfect method of purifying a government, a perfect method of purifying a human body and a human soul and a human mind. If you can make certain elements work together, you can make certain philosophies work together, certain sciences meet, certain races mingle. All these things are ruled by the same law. There is one master pattern, which is the great archetype. And all our sciences unfold this archetype. And whatever is true of the individual is true of the collective. 
Whatever the law is working in nature, it must work in man. And just as surely as certain energies in space unite to produce worlds, so certain energies in man must be and mingle to produce the development and unfoldment of his body and his functions. There is only one set of laws. And these laws become the keys to the hermetic art. For the hermetic art is nothing but the reduction of good intentions to a science. These arts tell you that if you have seven powers or of metals in nature, you have seven organs in the body, you have seven glandular structures of importance within the body, you have seven principal orifices in the body, you have seven principal centers in the brain. All of these are tied together by a sympathy. And as you have certain planets in the sky, so you have certain planets in the soul. And as these planets, by their forms, release certain psychic energies and intensities through man, these seven energies had in their turn created the arts and sciences, which are nothing but rationalizations by man on all kinds of his own energy. Man is able to build a house and the master architecture because he has a principle of architecture in his own soul. That principle of architecture within his own soul is represented by one of the seven metals. If, therefore, he lacked a certain element within his constitution, he would lack a, lack a dimension of consciousness. If gold was removed from his body, he would not only die, uh, but uh, assuming that he did not die, a proportion or dimension of consciousness would depart from him. Every one of these things is tied together forming one tremendous, all-inclusive pattern. And the pattern itself was described in the Hermetic Arts as the tomb of Christian Rosencrantz. For in this tomb was all of the symbolism of a miniature universe. And in the ceiling of it burned the other burning lamp, which was the symbol of consciousness. As therefore the consciousness in nature produces the world, so the consciousness in man sets up septenaries within itself. These septenaries are all on sympathy with each other, exactly like tuning forks, which at the same pitch will react to the sound one on the other. The same way diseases represent certain perversities in vibratory rates. These diseases can be reached by sounding their keynotes. They can be neutralized by other rates of vibration, representing their antipathies. This was the basis of the sympathetic medicine of Paracelsus. We treated the ailments of Mars with the power of Venus and the uh, ailments of Saturn with the power of Jupiter. But when you say Saturn and Jupiter as planets, they're also referring to elements, to minerals, to medications, to degrees of consciousness, to sense perceptions, to soul perceptions, to intuitional faculties, and to the whole gamut. Because all of these things move on the same vibration patterns. Thus we have in alchemy this concept of one universe in which a series of formulas exist. Now the alchemist took the universal formula, or space, which is the largest, and he reduced it to a formula that he could follow in his laboratory, and we can follow a little bit from Von Welling, in order that we may understand the symbolism of the pattern. In his great work on salt, sulfur, and mercury, Von Welling says that he took a tiny grain of the universal medicine and placed it on the surface of water, in a small report, which he diametrically sealed. He then placed this retort on a sand furnace. And a sand furnace is one in which the temperature is maintained at about the heat of the human body, which is very important. It never got too warm. The heat was applied only through sand. There was a thick layer of sand between the heat and the retort resting in the sand. And Von Welling says that after a certain time, when uh, the heat within the bottle reached that temperature of incubation, or the, te the temperature, as he says, that is achieved by the hen sitting on an egg, when that peculiar natural heat level was reached, this grain of the elixir, or the mysterious powder, began to move. And he said as he watched it, it began to spin. And as it spun, it threw parts of itself off. And these parts that flew off 
began to move around it. And in a half an hour, he saw unfold within the retort a complete solar system. <coughs> Why? Because every unit must follow the law of the entire. Now, if he had used a different level of analogy, he could have taken that same grain, <coughs> placed it uh, within another type of bottle, with another group of elements to work with, and under the same heat and length of time, this grain of the eternal index here would have begun to move in a different direction, would gradually have taken the whirling proportions of the human embryo and would have ultimately developed into a human body called the homunculus. It would have done exactly the same thing. And he would have had the tiny human being in the body. Now we also have in the Paracelsian theory, the possibility of reviving all kinds of forms from their own ashes. This he, uh, we have under various symbols. A plant burned to ashes within a sealed bottle, and then under a certain type of pressure and under certain use of alchemical formulas, heated to a certain degree. A plant or a shadow of it will grow again in the bottle in ashes. Years ago, I had an interesting experience with which we will try to <coughs> explain this. Uh, a man came to me who had spent many years up in the uh, northern part of Canada along the Klondike. He was an old gold miner. And he said, there's something that I've never been able to understand, namely that gold grows. He said, we could work out of age leave it for 10 years and come back to it and there was more gold there. He said, we were convinced that this gold accumulated in some way drawn by whatever amount of gold that was still left in the vein, the little part that we didn't get. The seeds were still there and this gold grew. And he said, as a proof of that, he said, I took a piece of ore with a small amount of gold still in it and I placed that gold in an electrically sealed jar, small jar. It was just a little bottle about this size, about two inches in diameter. They said, I have not unsealed this, and I want to show it to you. He said, when I placed it in there many years ago, there was just a grain of gold in it. But now, many years later, that little grain of gold has become a perfect little tree. It has grown from its own seed, <coughs> the growth of metals. And he said, I will tell you something else. He showed it to me. And it was undoubtedly exactly as he had described, and I'm inclined to believe him because we have the same record exactly from the Swiss gold miners of the 16th and 17th centuries who said that they had actually made gold grow. But another interesting thing this old miner told me was, he said, it didn't grow nearly as rapidly until I happened to discover something. Namely, that it grew more if I kept it on me. So therefore, I used to have many months I carried it inside my clothing, this little box. But so whenever it was close to me, it grew. And of course, the answer was body heat. As long as it was close to his body, it grew. And reports of these experiments have been carried on for hundreds of years. And uh, the concept of gold growing in the rocks, gold growing in the human body, body growing, all of these things tie up with the alchemical tradition, which it is, which is that all things grow. And that as the metals grow under certain conditions, so man grows. And what is the general heat which matures the metals? And the Buddhist might answer, the fire of aspiration by which all things grow. But there is a second mood or spirit within man, a warmth of man's own soul that makes him grow. And in the presence of this warmth within himself, and this warmth is the warmth of the mother hen sitting on the egg. <laughs> which even in itself is a rather interesting thing because it is the one of love. It is the one of service, of protection. 
All these things work together. And in alchemy, the universe is one mass of these interrelated laws. Laws which can be diagrammed on one level, played on a musical instrument on another, and on a third level, if applied inwardly, transform the sinner into the saint. They are living laws, living patterns, living archetypes, forever reproducing themselves on all levels. The alchemist says if you can discover these on one level, you can then apply this key to all other levels and have them, indeed, the key to the mystery of the universe. So this is a little something of the background. And from that, we must go on with the psychology of this, or the science of it, and I'll try to show you as we go along the symbols, the artistry, the books, the manuscripts by which this symbolism, this concept is unfolded. And it is the great genetic allegory, or the great law of analogy, as above, so below. And with the latter, so with the greater. All things differing in multitude and magnitude, but all identical in the great pattern of vital principles that sustain them. To know these principles, then, is to be the magician, to be the master of all things by knowing the laws and obeying the laws. An art is man's learning to obey, his constructive and wonderful ability to take these principles and amplify them so that they work more rapidly and perfect themselves more perfectly. Man working with law, therefore, is the master alchemist. And if he works with the law, the law, the law works for him. And he sees things grow and multiply in days, months, or years, which might otherwise require ages, unless they receive the cultivation of the hermetic cardinal. This is the concept on which we must later build the more detailed account of the alchemical procedure. did come into existence under the great choice of school system of Charlemagne were limited by a most reactionary and patristic philosophy. Even the physician did not dare to perform autopsy, did not dare uh, to dissect the human body. He was bound completely to the writings of Galen and Avicenna, authorities, traditional authorities, whose writings covered the field from the minor elements of the human body to the probable causes of volcanic eruptions. These traditional textbooks <coughs> did not give any opportunity or any individualism to the mind of the person. It was simply schooling according to tradition, schooled within a very narrow boundary of acceptances and rejections. Within the church itself, a number of systems of philosophy had arisen, particularly the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas. This man had a magnificent mind, but bound that he was, again, by the limitations of his church and his time, he was unable to break through into the free atmosphere of liberal thinking. Rebels of that period, like Bruno, Savonarola, and even Paracelsus, paid with their lives, or with their worldly goods and honors, for their efforts to break through this traditional path. In this same period, demonism and demonology and necromancy flourished. The mysterious magic attributed to King Solomon was restored. The grimoires came into existence. And men went out to crossroads at night to invoke spirits. It was a time of rather dismal intellectual benevolence. Yet this oppression forced upon man was not exactly in order with his growth and evolution. A more ancient man had achieved much more. The Greek and Roman civilization had given the world a magnificent look. The philosophical tables of Egypt and the Near East were spectacular. And these achievements and accomplishments did not simply die, they could not. The human being will not stop thinking and cannot stop thinking because someone tells him he must. Thus, there was beneath the surface of European thought and European life a tremendous surge of intellectualism. A search which could not break through, but which did begin to emerge as soon as the last of definition began to lift the boundaries on human beings. Now against this pressure from within the individual himself, the pressure of his own inadequacy, uh, there was the force of a limiting condition of environment. Internal pressure, plus this tremendous adamant 
boundary fixed upon his thinking and living resulted in an explosion, resulted in a definite breaking through from the internal psychic life of the human being. Now we cannot say, I don't agree with some psychologists who affirm that alchemy simply emerged from the individual, that it did remotely and originally do so, and that its forms undoubtedly were influenced by the pressures of the human psyche, we do not deny it. But I cannot accept that it was merely a spontaneous outburst. It was too well organized, too well developed, too carefully thought through. It is far more reasonable and likely that it represented a new appearance of a tradition struggling to restore its own place as a leader in the intellectual life of the human being. Now we know, as I have told you in other lectures, that after the Crusades, uh, the returning crusaders and the Templars and many other groups brought back to Europe a great deal of wisdom from the Near East. Also the rise of Moorish culture in Spain resulted in a liberation of the human mind and a return of lines and departments of knowledge hitherto long removed from European civilization and culture. We know that all through this transition in China by that Europe is comparatively late when compared to the fabulous and legendary accounts thereof. So we must recognize we're in the presence of another mysterious situation, namely that a art or cult arose in Europe uh, which was given an antiquity by means of a certain exaggeration on the part of those working with it. And actually, Alchemy, as we are going to consider it, developed within the period between uh, about the year 1500 and the year 1700. During these two centuries, this symbolism developed and elaborated itself almost beyond human imagination. Most of the symbols employed by the alchemists were derived from earlier sources, <coughs> but there was also a wonderful uh, mixture of creative ingenuity evident in the designs and figures. Some are obviously derived from mythology, uh, some from natural history as it was understood or misunderstood by the writers of that period. Certain parts of it belong to the symbolisms of ancient religious cults. A part was taken from the older symbolism of astrology. Uh, still other elements are almost unique to alchemy and do not occur elsewhere. Thus, historically speaking, we are dealing with a body of lore that rose to prominence, flourished for two centuries, and then gradually declined with the rise of chemistry as we know it today. I think we should bear in mind that there was an alchemy in antiquity, very roughly and inadequately drawn. But that actually, while we say that alchemy is the mother of chemistry, we might be wiser to realize that there was also a chemistry prior to alchemy, and that alchemy did not simply give rise to chemistry. Like many other subjects which are under more or less constant analysis, there are numerous misunderstandings. European alchemy is not of great antiquity. And the rumors about its roots in the mysterious past are highly symbolized. Actually, we have almost nothing on the subject of alchemy in European literature prior to the beginning of the 15th century AD. And nearly all of the so-called earlier works are backdated. That is, they were prepared and printed after the year 1500, but with fictitious dates of an earlier <coughs> period added to them. There is very little of alchemy in the Inconabula printing of the first 50 years of printing, between uh, 1445 and 1500. And we have very little evidence uh, that the alchemical writings attributed to ancient authors are genuine. For example, there are books, presumably, alchemical writings of Aristotle, which are certainly comparatively modern fabrications. <coughs> also, a number of fictitious characters were invented during the 16th and 17th centuries, 
as having lived at a much earlier date. But these inventions or unreal persons have no historical foundation. Actually, we find the phenomenon of the rise of alchemical symbolism in thought almost paralleling the rise of European astrological speculation and the rising of secret societies and of Rosicrucianism in Europe. Now, alchemy is not limited to European countries, that we know. And remnants of it and references to it are to be found in the writings of many ancient Asiatic peoples. But the rise of alchemy on an earlier day gave rise to alchemy. And this, in turn, uh, declined again, and chemistry once more emerged as the principal uh, carrier of tradition in this field of learning. Now, in consideration of these elements and factors, we are not in the presence, merely, of a great traditional account handed down for thousands of years, but of a cleverly devised program, integrated and perfected within a comparatively short period of time. Uh, this integration has a definite bearing upon the perpetuation of certain schools of philosophy and mysticism that originated in antiquity and also passed through various vicissitudes in the rise of European culture. Let us try to draw a picture of Europe at the time of the emergence of alchemy. Europe itself was coming out of the Dark Ages. It had just passed through the Renaissance and the Reformation. <coughs> The human mind was beginning to break the tremendous bonds that bound medieval man to a reactionary traditionalism. The human mind was also rebelling against the dogmatic theology which dominated this entire period of European history. For several hundred years, men had been unable to use their minds. In the first place, there was no way of training minds. There were no schools. There were no universities. There was practically no opportunity for the average citizen to become educated. The second problem was that Europe was devastated by natural and man-made catastrophes. The bubonic plague swept Europe, and during the course of about 300 years, its periodic ra uh, ravages totaled somewhere in the neighborhood of some 50 to 100 million human beings died of this plague. During this same period also, the rise of the Inquisition is to be noted, and the tremendous attack upon heresy upon liberalism and free thinking of all kinds. Even such schools and universities as